It's Monday. It's August 15th. And the word of the day is mubble fubbles, a 16th century term which means a vague Sunday eveningish blues and a slight sense of doom. Used in a sentence, here in 2022, I think we'd all be pretty happy with the vague, slight, and merely <laughs> once a week nature of the mubble fubbles. <laughs> oh, man. Can you remember when your blues were only vague, you know, rather than cripplingly specific? I know. Oh, they had pills for times. it and everything. It was yeah, awesome. It's, it's the Anyways, dream. I'm Eli Bostick. <laughs> I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Robot Spider Nightmares! We look at the only kind of honor that Boris Johnson is familiar with. And Zombie Robot Spider Nightmares! (laughs) Apparently that's a real thing. (laughs) But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight, are my fellow skeptic rats, Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, let's settle that meme that's going around before we get started. Which dystopian hellscapes have we entered? Is it A Handmaid's Tale, Fahrenheit 451, or sorry, Celsius 233, or like some other combination? Oh, excellent question. Uh, Let's see. Well, it's only been a couple of weeks since mine was definitely Escape from New York, if that counts. (laughs) Um, But otherwise, I've I've always said that we should all have one of those like Logan run crystals in our hand, but it should track net wealth. That's how we should run society. (laughs) Well, it's called the credit score, Marsh, and I'll have you know that mine is sitting right there with my high school GPA. (laughs) How did you get a house? What happened? It's a very, they made a mistake. <laughs> you tricked him. Yep. Good job. In our lead story tonight, Hillary Clinton's email server might have compromised classified information. <laughs> and when the FBI is investigating that sort of thing, it's a really bad sign. Well, turns out they didn't find any secret documents about our nuclear program in Hillary's email. Anyway, apropos of nothing, the FBI raided Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate last week and found... Top secret classified documents, including some related to our very literal nuclear program. And when the FBI is investigating that sort of thing and they find it, that's actually a really bad (laughs) sign. (laughs) The only way for Trump supporters to get more hypocritical at this point is for Donald Trump to personally attack a military base in Benghazi. (laughs) (laughs) It's Hillary. So here's the sequence of events we have so far. Earlier this year, the National Archives team was alerted about a whole bunch of documents that Trump took from the White House and brought to Mar-a-Lago. What, I'm not allowed a souvenir? Come on. (laughs) No, you are not. You're not allowed to do that. So they showed up, the archives team, and took back 15 boxes that included documents labeled classified for national security. So definitely you're not supposed to have that. But the National Archives team, they're all like librarians, right? So I, I just assume that they're all really pissed that he checked out too many classified documents at once. Because I think you're only allowed to borrow, I think it's five nuclear secrets for each of your like regular library cards. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's fair. <laughs> so from there, the archives got a tip that Trump was still hiding more of that stuff in Mar-a-Lago. And in June, Trump was given a subpoena regarding any remaining documents. Obviously, he didn't comply with that because we found some more. So... <laughs> Last week, here's what happened. The FBI was like, okay, fine. We would actually love to just take that stuff because we absolutely can. So they did. And they found 11 sets of documents, including some that were marked with one of the highest levels of classification. Their search warrant specifically identified three federal crimes at play here, including obstruction of justice, criminal handling of government records, and the Espionage Act. And in response to the raid, Trump's legal team has been saying, yeah, no, it's not It's not important. He likes to save newspaper clippings, and he's well within his rights to keep that stuff that he saved when he was in the White House. And apparently he put those newspaper clippings in a very special safe that had to be cracked by the FBI when they <laughs> raided his house. So... Uh, somebody is lying. One of these two sides is lying. Yeah, I just love the idea that he's saving these newspaper clippings. Like he's there creating a little my time as president scrapbook with, you know, cut up missile sch- schematics and glitter and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of puff paint. Yeah. Okay. But to be fair to Donald Trump, 
if they didn't change the nuclear codes and every possible password the second that dude wasn't president anymore, <laughs> that's on them. That's on America. Yeah, just change all the nukes just to be safe. Like The nukes <laughs> themselves are fine, but let's just change them just in case. Yeah. New bunkers, new everything. <laughs> Is the password to the nukes MAGA123? <laughs> God damn it, he did that a lot of spots. All right. So from there, we got a bunch of really bad poker from Trump and his team ever since the raid. First, he tried a bluff about the search warrant. The day after the raid, he made a statement saying, the Department of Justice should uh, release the warrant right now. The public needs to know. So the next morning, Attorney General Merrick Garland was like, yeah, we're going to release the warrant whenever we get through the paperwork of doing that. Also, everyone who knows how the law works added at that point, hey, uh, Donald Trump, you can just release the warrant yourself. You have it. You're allowed to do that. You can release the thing you just said you want released. So the warrant got released and it didn't have any illegal crayon marks or whatever <laughs> Trump thought he could hint at in order to cast some doubt. It actually made it even more clear just how serious of an investigation is happening when that warrant got released. It mentioned the federal crimes and the locked safe. Oh, my God. He's a YouTube libertarian asshole getting dragged through the window of his car by a cop, the ex-president. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got a second bluff that might be even dumber. The Trump team tried to claim that the FBI was planting evidence. During an interview last week, Trump's attorney, Christina Bob complained about not being allowed to follow around each FBI agent personally during the raid. And she said there's no proof that something wasn't planted. But then a couple days later, she forgot about that lie from earlier in the week. And she explained how Trump and his family were able to watch the entire raid on CCTV. The security team at Mar-a-Lago was told by the FBI to shut down the cameras at first. But then Trump's lawyers told the security team, no, they have to let you keep rolling. So the security team turned the cameras back on and the Trump family watched it all happen in real time from New York. Like nothing is more cartoonishly villainous than being sat in your headquarters watching CCTV footage of your compound getting raided by the FBI. It's a kind of plot point that Marvel would turn down for the kingpin for being a bit much. <laughs> so evil. You know, every single one of them had a brandy they were swishing around. For sure. Just trying Whether to they push the self-destruct button. People just keep bringing him Diet Cokes. God <laughs> damn it. Bring me an apple juice. It looks like brandy. Yeah. So the possibility of Trump getting punished for violating federal crimes like the Espionage Act, that's delightful. But it's also been super fun to watch all the GOP sycophants try to rally around Trump. And they ended up saying the exact opposite of something they said in 2016 about the FBI investigations and Hillary Clinton. That includes Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who said in 2016, exact quote, when you're attacking FBI agents because you're under criminal investigation, you're losing. We also got a very angry statement from accused pedophile Matt Gates, <laughs> who wants to defund the police all of a sudden. <gasps> He's all about defunding the police now. No, not not the bigots who shoot people for driving blackly, not that police, mm. the FBI, who also happen to be the people who investigate things like, I don't know, one's involvement in child sex trafficking and hiring <laughs> underage sex workers, stuff like that. <laughs> also, and OK, this is <laughs> this is my favorite part. One of the laws that Trump might get prosecuted for here is about unauthorized removal of classified documents. And it used to carry a penalty of one year in prison. But following the bullshit with Hillary's email server, Trump wanted to posture it up. And he signed a new version of the law that makes it a felony with up to five years in prison as a punishment. So he might get bit in the ass by his own stupid fucking Sharpie. I can't wait to find out. It is, it's so great. It'd be really funny if he does end up serving a harsher penalty because he set the penalty himself to be harsher. A bit like Icarus flying too close to the sun, except if Icarus was the one who created the sun in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see what happens with the federal crimes. But regardless... Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are just eating popcorn and watching. Hopefully they're watching the watch party of the CCTV. I don't know. <laughs> and also Biden and Harris are passing bills to make things better, despite 50 GOP senators doing everything they can to stop it. Speaking of which, Eli. Yes, indeed. In climate Mount Everest news, Joe Biden 
signed the single largest piece of climate change legislation passed by any country in the literal history of the world this week. But nobody cares because Donald Trump stole the nuclear codes like they were tiny shampoos from a hotel room that said, I care. I care about the planet not dying in a ball of fire. So we're going to talk about it. Okay, but. Was the bill perfect? Eli? It wasn't perfect. I'm not sure I even want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So this legislation had three big goals. I'm going to break them down. I'm going to try and talk about them in the easiest to understand ways possible. So first and foremost is the reduction of the output of greenhouse gases as a nation. Right. So might be a little hard for you, podcast listener, to remember the year 2005. People were protesting the Iraq war. American Dad premiered on Fox and weird example the United know. States reached the peak of its carbon emissions by putting out 7 billion tons of carbon a year. So thanks to this bill, those emissions will be cut by just over 40 percent, reducing our output to 3.8 billion tons and putting us well on track for our goals of being carbon neutral by 2050. This comes from the bill's largest investment, which is into wind, nuclear, and solar power in some really important ways. Right. And more generally, this is a big deal in terms of the you first problem with international environmental policy. So after China, the U.S. is the biggest carbon emitting country in the world. When we try to get international agreements about carbon reduction, it's pretty reasonable for other countries to say, OK, but you first. Well, we win now. And that's a good start. Yeah, but you say that. But the next leader of our country, Liz Truss, keeps giving interviews where she says that seeing fields full of solar panels is, quote, one of the most depressing sites in England. So I wouldn't invest too much in that whole lead by example <laughs> idea. I don't think we should rely on that. Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, the second goal of this bill is to make the effects of climate change and the legislation needed to ameliorate the damage of climate change less impactful on people especially poor people who will bear the brunt of climate change's consequences. This includes minimum wage and apprentice requirements for clean energy technologies, which, as you'll learn in a second, is a big part of this bill, and $22 billion for people to upgrade their homes to smarter, more efficient technology that doesn't rely on natural gas. And if you're wondering why that's part of a climate change bill or helps poor people, you should ask Marsh's neighbor, whose gas bill quadrupled last month for no reason that they can understand. Yeah. Like, fun fact, my wife is an energy trader for a living, which means she's got to have a big screen in the house that shows live gas prices at all times. And she can just sit there and watch those numbers just going up like a pinball machine racking up a new high score. <laughs> I mean, they wanted infinite growth, Marsh. They got infinite <laughs> growth. And third, this legislation is a huge step in making the United States an industrial center of the clean technology revolution. Right. So to vastly oversimplify this, this bill is a big bet that clean energy is here to stay and that we can be the place that most of the things needed for that clean energy can be made. Something in the range of $37 billion have been allocated to helping companies make solar panels, batteries, and other good clean energy stuff, which, again, all have to be made inside the U.S., and they have to hit those minimum wage and apprenticeship requirements. And I have to say, there is so much else in this bill that's really cool and really interesting, right? Capturing carbon emissions, turning the postal service and garbage trucks electric. There's so, so much cool stuff. And if you want the full breakdown, Hank Green of the Vlogbrothers did a really fantastic 22-minute video talking about the full bill, which I will link in the show notes. Okay, will you though? Okay, Heath will link in the show notes, but cool. <laughs> the long and short of this bill is, I know it seems hard to fathom, but in all likelihood... This bill and the tremendous good it will do will be the thing history remembers about the Biden administration and perhaps our generation. And we can do more. Of course, we can do more. We should do more. But we can only do that if we win the midterms. So fucking vote. <laughs> and while we're feeling hopeful, let's toss things over to our sponsor this week, Green Chef. Hi. I'm Eli Bosnick and long-term vegan. You know, going to restaurants could be a little bit tough for me. Uh, we got a salad, but the dressing has egg and fish, so you want some wet leaves? Would you like to pay us money for wet leaves? We have that. 
which means I do quite a bit of cooking at home. And if you've got a special diet like mine, I bet you're doing the same thing. But all the prepping and shopping, boiling and chopping can take up time you just don't have. Uh, Eli, when you said uh, dice the tofu, did you did you mean just throw it away? Because that's what I did. Luckily for folks like you and me, there's Green Chef. Green Chef is a CCOF certified meal kit company. Green Chef makes eating well easy with plans to fit every lifestyle. Whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just looking to eat more balanced meals, Green Chef offers a range of recipes to suit your preferences. Yeah, so I went back in the kitchen, and you can't have the bread either, it turns out. Would you like a paper napkin? Plus, Green Chef is the only meal kit that is both carbon and plastic offset. They offset 100% of their carbon footprint, as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. 100% of their seafood meets the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch rankings of certified best choice or good alternative. With Green Chef, you're reducing your food waste by at least 23% versus grocery shopping. Okay, so I found a vegan restaurant, but it's a 47-minute walk away from the steakhouse where we'll be eating dinner. Is, is that all right? But don't take my word for it. Take my word for it. Because I'm a literal Green Chef customer. Green Chef keeps me eating good and saves me time so I can crack out the goof-filled podcasts your body so desperately needs. Go to greenchef.com slash skeptocrat135 and use code skeptocrat135 to get $135 off across five boxes. And your first box ships for free. Once again, you're going to go to greenchef.com slash skeptocrat135 and use code skeptocrat135 to get $135 off across five boxes and your first box ships free. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Oreos? Yeah, I'll eat Oreos. Oh, I don't know. We don't have any Oreos. I'm asking if you have any Oreos. Why would I bring Oreos to your restaurant? Because you're hungry. Okay. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in dishonours system news, in a political system as old as the UK system, there's inevitably going to be things that seem weird to the outside world. Like, for example, how Parliament gets opened each year by a mace-wielding official in fancy dress who's officially known <laughs> as Black Rod. You know, us fun and quirky Brits. Okay, that's all real. Mm. Black Rod shows up at the chambers for the House of Commons and they slam the door in her face. And then she knocks three times, right, with a magic staff and then, like, answers a riddle or something. And then they can start their very serious job in Parliament. Do I have that about right, Mark? Yeah, you absolutely do. We are a very serious democracy. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay, she is the Queen Victoria Mother Hathaway of Denmark, Keith. Accuracy <laughs> matters. I don't think that was accurate. I don't think what you said was right. But for all of the idiosyncrasies of the UK system, perhaps nothing is more outdated than the UK's honours system and its second chamber of parliament, the House of Lords. So the Lords act a bit like the US Senate, except rather than giving a disproportionate amount of power to you know, random representatives from underpopulated states, the House of Lords instead gives that power to, well, celebrities, billionaires and senior figures from the church. And, and then they hold that power for life, for life. Okay, you have no idea how much we long for Andrew Lloyd Webber to be a 14-term Senator Marsh. Count your lucky stars, you have Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> is he seriously a per... Is he no, he's in the House of Lords, yeah. Andrew yeah. Lloyd Webber, who fame... I mean, you say count here. your lucky stars. He famously flew back from America on his private jet in order to cast a vote against raising the minimum wage. So, cool. still better than U.S. Senators, I stand <laughs> by my statement. <laughs> Now, look, I know what you're thinking hearing all of that. You know, you're thinking that sounds wildly undemocratic and completely open to abuse. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're not the only one thinking that because outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson has clearly had the same thought, although without any of the negative tone that I could hear when it was in your thoughts. <laughs> oh, OK, got it. Yeah, yeah, it's a tone thing. So it was like, that sounds wildly undemocratic and open to abuse. I played Limp Biscuit with a bunch of these guys at Eaton. This is perfect. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely right. that. Absolutely that. Because Boris has put forward plans to pack the House of Lords with political cronies as part of his resignation honours list. Because, and get ready for another quirky British idiosyncrasy here, it's tradition that a departing Prime Minister gets to hand out peerages and knighthoods and other titles as part of leaving the job, as part of being asked to stop being Prime Minister. They get to make these kind of appointments. And it's a power that has only been exercised by outgoing Tory uh, prime ministers for the last 40 years. Um, and it's the equivalent of kind of like, I don't know, giving Trump a Supreme Court pick specifically because he lost the election. <laughs> okay. 
Tomato, tomato. So, <laughs> Boris Johnson, I'm assuming he's going to make himself a magical lord for life using that power? Worse, Heath. Way, way worse it's, than that. It's worse because than that. Because among the recipients, uh, the, the purported recipients of this magical lord power is the former editor of the Daily Mail and the unofficial head of Tory propaganda, Paul Dacre. So, you know, that's obviously going to go great for the rest of uh, all time in our country. And then there's a lot of people who, who are on the list just because they donated millions to the Tory party, like uh, Lubov Chernikin, who is the wife of a former minister in Vladimir Putin's government. And if anyone's questioned the timing of nominating a, a Russian who's related to Putin's government into the heart of the British establishment... I was questioning that, yep. Yeah. Well, if you question that, I'm going to point you to Boris's good friend, Eugene Lebedev, who Boris named into the House of Lords in, in 2020, despite him being the son of a literal KGB agent who spent his career spying on and in Britain. What and is now, happening? Yeah, now we literally have to run all of our laws in our country past Baron Lebedev of Hampton in the London Borough of Richmond up, up on Thames and of Siberia in the Russian Federation. <laughs> Boris made a lord of Siberia and put him in charge of our laws. Okay, well, that sounds bad. Just make sure the Premier League stays free of corrupt power and oil money. <laughs> uh, that's an important thing for you guys. Oh, God, too soon, Heath. <laughs> So the upshot here is, you know, we might be getting shot of Boris Johnson and his lazy, arrogant corruption pretty soon. But like with every other thing he's ever done in his life, we'll be dealing with the mess that he's left behind for a very long time. <sighs> and in CPAC machine news, the Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC, happened again last week. That's the big semi-annual meetup for alt-right bigots, where they talk about spreading important conservative values in America, like social injustice, you might remember their event from last year that had a golden idol of Donald Trump along with a stage in the shape of a literal Nazi rune. That event last year was called CPAC Uncancelled, and the title of the latest iteration was CPAC Awake, Not Woke. Right, and as we'll learn... At the end of this story, that wasn't even close to the worst catchphrase they came up with for themselves this year. <laughs> no. Right. The thing is, if they're just going to onboard any new phrase used by progressives, I think it's absolutely our duty to come up with something really new and really fucking weird, just to fuck with them next year. We could start naming CPAC ahead of times if we just start popularizing some phrase we come up with. Oh, I like that. Democrats, Nazi says what? They, <laughs> now they're doing it. <laughs> All right. What? Oh, okay. I <laughs> so... Let's meet a few of the speakers from last week. First up, we have Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who ran on a platform of mostly eugenics. Now, to his credit, that is technically a platform, unlike the Republican Party, which doesn't have one. So it's something. Uh, he, this feels like a nothing is better than something situation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know what? Uh, retracted. But okay. So to his debit, on the other hand, Orban doesn't even do eugenics correctly. Now, okay, that's a weird comment. Stay uh, with me. Okay. Stay, stay with me. <laughs> he thinks an all-white population is a good thing. If, we, if you had to do eugenics, that wouldn't be the way to do it, is all I'm saying. So, according to Orban, Europeans should not become peoples of mixed race. That's an exact quote. And during the talk at CPAC, he said, again, exact quote, the horrors of Nazis and communists happened because Western states in Europe abandoned Christian values. They want to create a new world, a post-Western world. Also, I should add, he looks like you Googled evil white guy. He like really exactly does. He absolutely that. does. I actually did a Google image search, and a bunch of the results show Victor Orban doing almost a Heil salute and then catching himself. Like, really fucking close. Yeah, a lot. Podcast listener, Heath has included pictures in our notes, and it's it's strange love-esque. <laughs> it's it, so close. One really time is. he just tilted it a little bit. He, like, did a full Heil, and then he was like, left. I angled left <laughs> a little bit. It, it just seems absolutely incredible to me that they had Viktor Orban speak. Like, what, was Vladimir Putin unavailable? Was he busy at the time? <laughs> Although, to be fair, if they did have Putin, he wouldn't be doing any right-handed Nazi salutes anytime soon. Not without, like, a, a dedicated <laughs> arm guard. What? What's happening with... I don't care. I don't care what's happening. <laughs> I, I hope it dies. And him. So, we also got an appearance by Marjorie Taylor Greene, also known as Midge Tidge Gidge or Madge Tadge Gadge. Still waiting to hear about everybody's preference on Tim, that. Tim, get on that. Twitter poll. Okay, well, if it helps, Tadge is slang for penis in the UK. It genuinely is. <laughs> oh, is it? So just in case that, any, <laughs> if that influences anyone's preferences, Tadge is penis. All right, that's Madge Tadge Gadge. Official, right? <laughs> Midge Tidge. Absolutely. Midge Tidge Tadge. Midge Tadge? 
Tim, get all the combinations. Yeah, out get all the possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So, Democracy. MTG put on her best all orange prison cotillion outfit. That's the only way I could describe what she was wearing there. And she gave a talk that was focused mostly on defending a very important journalist in America who was being treated unfairly by our court system. Of course, she was referring to Alex Jones. She <laughs> clearly wrote a whole big segment about the conspiracy to silence Alex Jones. But then the morning of her speech, he got ordered to pay $45.2 million to the victims of his lying. So she had to add a quick little bit <laughs> saying like, okay, fuck, yeah. Cell phone thing was rough. I think we all saw that. But still, something, something, persecution. We're just saying <laughs> he, he shouldn't silence him even though he's the worst. And... If you haven't watched the video of Alex Jones learning in real time while sitting on the stand in court that his legal team accidentally sent the opposing counsel a copy of his entire phone <laughs> full of very direct proof of his perjury from earlier in that exact trial, it's definitely worth a quick little watch. It's precious. It's no, my favorite Keith, video. it's not precious. My son is precious. It's epic. It's everyone <laughs> comes through the portals at the ends of Avengers level satisfying. It's the best standing evidence for the existence of God, Heath. Oh, it's God, yeah, there. absolutely. I, I, I can't even comprehend that there is a world in which anybody hasn't seen this clip yet, because in a just world, that clip would be played 24-7 on every video screen in the on the entire planet. Like, a, a bit like in 1984, <laughs> but a definitely positive thing. <laughs> I like how the lawyer's voice gets a little shaky because he's too excited. Oh, he, he gets so pumped. He's like, so Mr. Jones, come, you can do this. Please. Sorry, you just time out. Mm. My nose is bleeding. I'm very excited. Sorry, this is literally the craziest thing ever to happen in history. Mr. <laughs> Jones. <laughs> it's, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds you ever see those proposal videos, right, where the guy's <laughs> freaking out and so his voice is shaking a little bit? <laughs> it's like that, but it's America. <laughs> Fantastic stuff right there. And we also got a speech, of course, from Donald Trump, who was not wearing all orange yet, at least. <laughs> well, I mean, he was from the neck up, at least. Yeah, yeah that's, that's how it goes. So Trump mentioned how he's angry at Joe Manchin for being too liberal and making a deal with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on the new health care tax and climate spending bill. Trump said, I'll go down to West Virginia and campaign against him. And, okay, just for the record, Manchin is not up for re-election this year, so <laughs> Trump's going to be campaigning against nobody for nothing in West Virginia. Looking yeah. forward to it. Uh, I, or anywhere else, I have a hunch. Yeah. <laughs> 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 He'll campaign from wherever he ends up. It's fine. It'll be fun to watch, actually. And that brings us to the craziest part of the conference. And, okay, that's a competitive contest, but this is the craziest part. They had a performance art exhibit in which an actor sat inside a mock jail cell pretending to be a January 6th rioter, and he wept. As part of the exhibit, onlookers were given headphones so they could stand there and listen to his weeping. But the thing is, right, a January 6th rioter in a prison outfit in a cell audibly weeping. Could the Democrats hire him for their conference too? He'd absolutely kill it there. I'd yeah. pay money to watch that. Stop I'll sending hire him right now. Right? Stop <laughs> sending me emails for $7. Charge me $7 for a pee balloon to throw. <laughs> also, side note, the performance art piece was put together by a guy named Brandon Straka. And he was a defendant during the J6 investigation who ended up helping the FBI. He was going to get in trouble for being, you know, a domestic terrorist. And he narked on all his friends to get a plea deal that kept him out of a weepy jail cell and put other people in that weepy jail cell <laughs> that he used for his modern art. Right. So the audible weeping that you could hear was from a tape of his friends from the wire that he was wearing. Got it. That all makes sense. <laughs> yeah. now. He'll never be. recover from the trauma of turning in everyone he knows to save his ass. <laughs> so stupid. OK, one other detail. Following the conference, there were news reports about a large banner that said, we are all domestic terrorists at CPAC. But that's insane. So there was speculation that it was maybe fake news. Well, it was not fake news. Somebody at Snopes had the job of actually checking on this, and they found video showing that exact banner at the event. They also found another banner that said, you're next, the rise of the Democratic Gulag. 
<laughs> and in Crazy Zombie Spider Nightmares news, <laughs> in a headline I couldn't have designed to be more terrifying if I tried, scientists created zombie spider robots this month. This because is real? They'd like, yep, because they'd like Heath mm-hmm. and Wright never to sleep again. <laughs> Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Great episode. <laughs> no, guys. So fun. No. All right. Listen. Moving so, on. This is do, a do, do. <laughs> <laughs> What's the end noise? It's nothing. So this is a study that comes to us from Rice University and marks a big advance in the field of necrobiotics, a field that I think we can all agree we should have Mm -mm. given up on Mm -mm. just as soon Mm -mm. as we named it. Hard pass. And in this study, researchers were able to turn the corpses of dead wolf spiders into grippers capable of lifting more than 130% of their own body weight and lasting through 1,000 open-close cycles. (laughs) See, this is why you don't let those Sid from Toy Story kids do science. You know, you enlist them in the army at 16 and you hope that friendly fire just takes that problem right off your hands. Exactly, (laughs) yes. So, researchers indicate that the necrobotic grippers could have multiple applications, including the assembly of things like microelectronics, collecting specimens, and creating an undead army of spiders immune to pain with the sole purpose of crawling into your nose and ears while you're asleep. God damn it! What is wrong with you scientists? Okay, somebody woke up from my literal nightmare after a zombie spider robot lifted my face off my goddamn face, and that person was like... Cool, grippy. <laughs> See, this is why we have anti-vaxxers. Science cannot be trusted. We can't trust them. Yeah. And just in case you weren't terrified like Keith is already, listen to the fucking insane sentence that the Smithsonian decided to end their article about on this subject. Quote, While the paper may conjure nightmare-inducing images of robot zombie (laughs) spiders for some, co-author Daniel Preston, a professor of mechanical engineering at Rice, clarifies that their research doesn't actually qualify as (laughs) reanimation. Don't care. Yes, it does also. And according to Preston, quote, Despite looking like it might have come back to life, we are certain that it's inanimate. Not adding, for now, you fucking (laughs) idiots, for now. (laughs) How have you not seen any movies? You haven't seen any movies? There's one behind us right now. I guarantee (laughs) it's inside us. We're first because we're talking about it. And finally tonight, in uranium enrichment news, with with all the escalating aggression and increasingly deranged behaviour from Vladimir Putin, many have understandably been very worried about the threat of imminent nuclear war. And thankfully, that possibility looks a lot less likely now, thanks to the intervention last week of none other than serial fantasist and attention seeker Uri Geller. <laughs> yeah, and Russia doesn't have... James, Randy, and Johnny Carson to protect them from all that magic. (laughs) It's true. Yeah. I don't know, fellas. This has given me big let them fight energy. You know what I'm saying? No losers in this one. (laughs) In an open letter to Vladimir Putin posted to his Twitter, Geller warned that Russia better shelve all those plans they've got to carry out a strategic nuclear strike against enemies of the West, including the western coast of Scotland. (laughs) <laughs> specifically that's okay. a strategic target interesting <laughs> they know about our strategic haggis stores gentlemen scramble scramble I say so Geller does at least explain that he needs help in opposing Putin he can't do all of this on his own that would be ridiculous because he implores his followers to take five seconds out of their day to visualise a radiant energetic force field like a dazzling golden shield in the sky which hmm. I think isn't a great visualization exercise for people who are worried about a nuclear apocalypse, make them imagine <laughs> sure. this giant radiant field in the sky. Yeah, also kind of a dick move. Now you're just bouncing the missile to like the next town over or whatever. <laughs> I feel like, let's make it a little easier, put the force field over Russia and we all focus on that like a dome to block. Just think it through. Yeah, this is nice. serious. That works. Do your magic better. So Geller, though, is, he's clearly not an idiot, given that he ends his letter with a direct warning to Putin that, quote, If you proceed, your mission control computers will crash, your navigation systems will fail, and your missiles will malfunction. And as anyone who's seen any footage of the state of Russian military equipment over the last few months, that's not so much a threat as an accurate account of current events. <laughs> ah, yeah. Two spoon, Marsh. Way two spoon. <laughs> How dare you? 
And th- there's definitely something odd going on with Geller right now. Odder, odder than usual, granted, odder than usual anyway, because he was also in the news again just last week explaining that he'd bought an island off the coast of Scotland that he wanted to turn into a micronation with its own flag and its own constitution, explaining that, quote, I always wanted to own an island and be like James Bond. And I, Uri, mate, you own your own <laughs> island and you're making military threats to political leaders. You do realise, you do sound like you're from a Bond film, but you're not the guy wearing the tuxedo here. <laughs> Talk. No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to look away for a second while I bend this. No, please. <laughs> what? Look at my other hand or something. Make eye contact? No. Well, I, I just want to... <laughs> no. You're ruining it. <laughs> That's the whole thing. That's how he they just, do it. He just bends the spoon when just somebody looks at it. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Mm. I don't know why I'm asking. Like, oh, does he actually bend it? <laughs> I mean, mind. Occasionally, no. he'll switch it out for a pre-bent spoon if he's got the opportunity to. That's true. Which, okay. to be fair, is bending it when you're not looking. <laughs> that, that is true. Also, he's just doing time. it at home. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to Michael Marshall. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Travis Harder, Chris Pettit, Stephen O'Hanlon, Lauren Francis, Robert Franklin, Peter in Korea, and Steve Proper, who's beautiful and very versatile genitals have the tensillary strength to easily replace Lovecraftian zombie robot spiders for any important scientific applications we might need them for. Fuck, what are we doing? (laughs) And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Spider on your leg! Ah! And Marsh, I hear you might have an event going sometime soon. Can yeah, absolutely. We, we've got QED coming up on 28th to 30th of October in Manchester, UK. Uh, the Ooh. most fun sceptical conference happening, at least in Manchester, UK, possibly even an even broader place than uh, the broader area than Manchester, UK. But no, it's going to be a huge amount of fun. You guys are coming. You're doing yep. a GAM. You're going to have some other stuff that you guys are doing that we've not announced yet. We've got loads of other interesting Secrets. and fun people coming. It's, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. Looking forward to it. Fantastic conference. Everybody should go if you can. QDCon.org is where everybody needs to go to check it out. I think you said chopping twice. Oh. Did you say shopping? Yeah, I, I did. I heard chopping well, twice. I'll say it again just in case. Okay. But all the prepping and shopping, boiling and chopping, I now hear it that I yeah. can't say the word it's crazy. shopping. Okay, here we go. <laughs> But all the prepping and shopping, nope, too hard, too hard. <laughs> Way now, too hard. Now that sounds like the first time I made an essay. Say shop. My life. Shop. <laughs> now chop. Chop. Okay, now I don't shopping need and chop. practice saying okay. chop. That's the problem. Too much saying chop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but all the prepping and shopping, boiling and chopping can take up time you just don't have. I did it. I did it. I said ah! chopping. You hit chop really, really hard. You hit so it very hard well. on chop. Yeah, you nailed it. I think it was fine. I think if, if Heath wasn't giggling squeakily in the background, no one Thank would have you. noticed. you. No one would have <laughs> noticed, and no one will. <laughs> Sugar used to be ground by bone wheels because other wheels would dye the sugar, like brown or different colors. <laughs> but if you used bone wheels, it would keep it white. As in um, wheels made out of bone. Yes, as in wheels yeah. made out of bone. They don't right, do so we can't anymore. just say bone wheels like that's just a regular thing. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you live in Manchester. You have a couple of bone wheels. You've never been to a bone wheel party in England? Okay. <laughs> Look in your in your junk drawer. You've got a bone wheel in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right next to the sharp scissors and the... the bit you always save from something you're throwing away because you never know when you're going to need some bone wheels. You know, they're right. just so it's universally yeah, no, you you instructions in to all your electronics your bone wheels, the one screwdriver you own. Two thumbtacks that you hurt yourself on every couple months. <laughs> every time. 
a D battery, but just one? <laughs> one of those bulbs that goes in the spotlights that you think probably doesn't work, but you're not so certain that it doesn't work that you're willing you're to throw, throw it away. throw it away, yeah. But every time one goes out, you try it, it doesn't work, and you think, okay, that might have just been the fitting that time. I'll keep it just in case. Right. You're attacking me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have that... 10 feet I've got two in right my drawer. Now. That's why I uh, mentioned yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> I have a whole kitchen cabinet full of them. It's the two yeah. worst. They're sat on the side right now. And I'm like, okay, those are done. I'm going to throw them away. And I haven't thrown them away because I'm going to put them back in the drawer in case they still work. <laughs> <laughs> the preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020.